What doesn't kill you makes you stronger and just, you know, focus on you. So that, that's a good thing. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. My guest this week is Kevin Furlong. Kevin is co-owner of Elite Fitness Gym in the Isle of Man. I hope you enjoy hearing Kevin's story of how he's pivoted into co-running and owning the island's biggest gym business from an early love of mechanical engineering and cars. Thank you for listening. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much, Aaron. Well, it's um, it's been, I've done a little bit of research before you came along today, but um, full disclosure, I've been coming along to Elite Gym for a while now, so um, I'm really pleased that you said yes, finally, to being interviewed. I've badgered you for long enough, so <laughs> thanks for coming along. Yeah, you're welcome. And it's nice to see you again. Yeah. So um, in doing a bit of um, background, there's, uh, there's certain things I found out about you, so um, all good, oh, I might that, add. That's good. <laughs> um, so... Well, let's kick off. Let's um, ask you all about your your life in the Isle of Man and um, where you come from and how you've how you've managed to end up here. So. Okay. Well, born in Ireland, um, so I moved to the Isle of Man in 1989. I just mainly came over for a holiday. A friend of oh, mine right. was was living here at the time, so a uh, usual thing. Came over, not very much money. Um, ran out of money, and then just thought, oh, I need to get some cash just to uh, keep my holiday going yeah and at the time the album was you know was actually booming at the time uh, and uh, yeah one of my friends he had a, a business and he said oh, just come and do a few hours for me so right. that turned into well we well, now 40 odd years later <laughs> so wh- wh- which part of ireland did you come from uh wexford is the southeast sunny southeast so it's on the um, yeah, South Coast. It's a little place called uh, for Enniscorty, which is Enniscorty. Yes, right. So, been yeah, my parents, my family, uh, they've all been living around the area for well, I think straight back to the 13th century, actually. Right. Sure for a long name. Okay, so brothers and sisters, or uh... yeah, big family. Got uh, two brothers and three sisters. Okay. Um, and one, one sister, she's married to, so I got two nephews. Um, everybody else not married except myself. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so are they all still in Ireland, or did any of them follow you? Yeah, two of my brothers they followed me over for, for a while, um, but they've now returned back to Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, my sisters they all stayed, you know, as a class at home, back with my family. Yeah. Yeah. And what did you decide to do when you were at school? What um, what pathway did you follow? Okay. So school. Well, I, my family, my. My, my parents, my, especially my dad, have always been involved in horses. My, my, my dad, he managed a, a horse too. Um, and part of basically what I wanted to do at the time was do something with horses. And um, I looked at being like a farrier or a blacksmith. Right. Um, so at an age of, I think it was about 15, 16, I wanted to leave school. Yeah. But my mum wouldn't let me. She goes, no, no, you've got to continue studying. So the Irish, um, you leave school so either 16 or 18, but 18 is like the, the leaving certificate, which you, yeah. it's probably just equivalent to A-level type A. Yeah, actually. okay. So you stayed on and did that? So stayed on, did that. Um, and then you know, left school, uh, didn't really know what to do. No horse jobs then? Um, well, I was, I was working, helping my dad, working with my dad at, on, the, on, the, on the farm. Yeah. But other than that, I, you know, just think, well, long term, what, what could I do? Usual thing, you know, just tried everything. Um, so, but yeah, as I said, I came over here, it was the, I think about July, um, 89, something like that, the end of, around the end of the, that sort of time. It's yeah. Been, it's been a while. Like I said, just, just as a holiday. And then I said, for my mom, I said, oh, I'm going to stay. And she goes, no, no, you've got to come back and, you know, decide, is that what you want to do? Yeah. So I did, then I came back, I think it was on the, um, I think after Christmas, so, you know, end of December, January time, I think it was. Came back over in the... Back yeah, to the island. Back to the Alabama, yes. Yeah. Give it another go. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed every <laughs> yeah. thing. Because you, you often you see, you know, you go to a, a place on holiday and it's, I guess everybody's had that feeling. They go somewhere and they think, I'd love to live here. Yes. But it's a, a, re, a different reality to actually going to, to live somewhere and work there as opposed to being on holiday. Yeah, I think it's, um, I was fortunate because, like I said, the, the company that I ended up working for, um, like I said, I knew uh, one of the guys who was working there. Um, and I got on pretty well with most of the staff, and the company was growing quite rapidly as well. So yeah. It was expanding. So they, what sort yeah, of company was that then? Uh, it was a company called Wet Cover. They used to make keyboard covers for uh, oh, cash tools and keyboards. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so it, it started off as quite an interesting little story how I actually managed to get the job, if it was like. Yeah. So the companies were moving premises. And the, the boss at the time, he was they had like uh, molding machines, which were compression molding machines, and they needed to be moved but because they were big machines and they needed to be stripped down into parts so they could be moved easier. Uh-huh. Um, and when he said, the boss he said, oh, we're going to move this machine after lunch, but I misheard him. I thought he said, we need to take this machine apart to move it. So he went for lunch, and of course I thought, right, I'll get stuck in and take yeah. this machine apart. So... <laughs> So when he came back from lunch a few hours later, came back and the machine was pretty much in pieces and he was a bit like, what have you done? I said, so, oh, I thought you said take it apart. And he goes, and he said, no, I'll take it apart when I get back. And um, so when he got, he said, how are you going to put it back together? I said, well, I took it apart. I can remember how to put it back together. Yeah. And he goes, well, where do you get that information from and how do you know what you can do? I said, well, I've been grown up on farms. You've always taken machinery apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, a younger age is messing about with cars and things when you're younger. Uh huh. Right. So, what was the you know, just probably necessity? You just you just fix things when they break. Yeah. So that's uh, so. Then after that, he said, right. Well, if you can put it back together, I'll give you a full time job. So anyway, we got moved machines and put it. So we put it back together when we got to the other side of the, the um, we were moving to. Yeah. And then after that, we went to. Um, yeah, he said, oh, what about doing a a proper qualification so he offered me an apprenticeship engineering yeah so that was uh, and I started doing uh, two day uh, so yeah two days and one night or something yeah at the Yellowman College yes so we're done and I did the higher national diploma in mechanical and production engineering okay well, so that explains was, a lot yeah so that's where <laughs> the, the engineering sort of and yes. the machines and that okay. kind of thing comes from so yeah, yeah sure. continue that um, and so that's sort of that and athletics sort of got me into the direction yes of. I remember you from athletics you were a bit faster from what <laughs> I remember it's about sprinter weren't you um, yeah I mainly did 110 meter hurdles that was my yeah my passion if you like so that was yeah, something we did and that was some, that was something from school that you'd um, grown up with doing or did you yeah, get into I, athletics later you know, I did um, in, in Ireland I've, I've got national medals for 110 meter hurdles and long jump and that kind of thing wow, so okay. I think at, at one point I think silver yeah I got I think four national medals and uh, Silver, bronze, and that kind of thing. Never got, yeah. a go- never got a gold, which was a bit of a yeah. Were you Ireland Games? I remember you in Ireland Games. Yeah, so uh, two thousand and one, the first. No, that wasn't the first one. Um, that was at the nineteen ninety one. Was the 91. first one that was in Ireland? I remember that. It was yeah. my first game. That was your first games. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically, when I move over here, mm-hmm. um, there's a good group of guys I met purely by chance in the, in the cinema over here. There were guys having a conversation about times and training and stuff. So I uh, introduced myself to these guys when one was Alice Rodsley. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so I was speaking to Alice too, and uh, he was introduced myself, as I said. And he was he said about, oh, you want to come and train with us? And um, another guy, Martin Bullock, who was also introduced. Those guys I met quite early on. Yes. So we started training together then I never heard of the Island Games so that was a bit of a No, know, well the Island Games is, is kind of a little it, it unique is, to the Island, unique. Island communities uh, well, the Island's too big to qualify Yes <laughs> So yeah that was that was something which the guys were training for and talked about and I thought oh that sounds interesting Yes um, So yeah that was in 1991 Yeah It was my first games that was in Holland just off yeah, between fin- Finland and Sweden Okay how did you, how did you do in that? Um, I came fourth in the 110 meter hurdles which was a bit disappointing Yes the worst, um, worst position to be in, isn't it? No medal. Yeah, no medal. Uh, but we, we did okay in the relays. Yeah. So we got some medals of that. So that really sort of like fired me up to think, okay, two years' time I'm going to do, do a little bit better. Yeah. So yeah, that was... Uh, well, I checked the records and you're still the Manx record holder for the indoors 400 metres. You set it in 1997 and you did 50 seconds and 16, 50.16, which is oh, yeah. pretty rapid. Yeah, that was um, an interesting year, actually. I remember that. Uh, the reason I did that was I was carrying a bit of an injury. So I didn't, have, and we were training for the indoor championships. So oh, yes. Was, yes okay. for the, my, I said my main event was the 60 meter sprint and 60 meter hurdles. Yeah. And because I was carrying a slight injury, I thought, well, I don't really want to push myself yeah. too hard. So I thought, well, as we're here, what we could do, we just sent through the 400 meter sprint as well that's that's amazing because you you know anyone who knows sprinting knows that you don't just go to a longer distance if no. you're a flat out sort of yeah i think it's because of the sort of the training we're doing we're doing quite a, quite a hard training winter if you like so we yes. thought it'd be nice just to get out and actually stretch your legs if you like so yeah i wasn't expecting that time that was yeah. quite a, a surprise for yes. me yes 
Fantastic. So when did you when did you carry on with the, with the athletics bit? Did you did you stop that at some point? Yeah, stopped that in two thousand. Main the, the Island Games were actually on, it was on the island. Yes. And um, I was struggling with an injury before that. Yeah. Um, so in one of the in the actual heats, um, yeah, I ended up pulling my calf muscles. So I stopped. I thought you know, it's about time to uh, to retire. I think. Yeah. Yes, because even things like you know getting a lot. I, I was quite fortunate all through my career. I didn't really get that many injuries. Yeah. I'm um, nothing too serious, but yes. Yeah, and then as obviously you get a bit older, you start training, trying to you're training harder to reach the same sort of targets. Yeah, it's interesting. So. Back to the HND and engineering. Yes. So that that took you to what did you get on with then? Okay, so I was working for a company I mentioned before called Wetcover. So we we're doing, um, yeah, making the compression molding machines and tools and things. Yes. Um, and then I thought, I oh, know, well, I can I can start doing this on my own. So I ended up starting a little company myself. We we're doing various different things from from different manufacturers, making compression molding machines, tools, various different things. Yeah. Um, and then that led me into doing because I was doing quite much training at a gym called Nautilus gym right. um, and their machines were like falling apart and quite worn and stuff so I ended up doing a little bit of maintenance for the, the guy that owned it George Mitchell yeah and that led to doing a little bit more and then I thought oh, I could be doing a bit more of this so I started taking up more of my time doing that kind of thing which I enjoyed actually because yeah. you know it was, again it was taking me into gyms which I was used to for many years being in a gym environment and then that led to I think oh, I'll start doing some more gym maintenance and then I started uh, George, he moved premises, and when he moved premises, he asked me what I do, help him out, doing a little bit more time. And yeah. like I, say, I really started to enjoy that. Um, and again, from the my background in athletics and training yes. and coaching and that kind of thing. You tell it's all coming together, yeah. really. Yeah. So I really enjoyed being in the gym environment, coaching mm-hmm. people. So then from that, um, I did a, a course with um, with George. Was it really uh, a guy called John Cousins? Okay, and he was here. Uh, he he he's based in the U, in the US. Right. Um, but he, he was over and part of it he was on a training course in the UK and George was he was really he was, he was very fortunate to get the guy over yeah because um, he's he's trained some superstars in America um, yeah. and he's also he was familiar with or he worked with um, the guy who invented the Nautilus machines okay Arthur Jones uh, right. that's a bit of history behind that one yeah. so John Cousins uh, he worked with Arthur and he you know so that's going back probably would have been probably the 60s I guess when they were doing that sort of thing yeah so yeah but it was and then, starting to get a bit big thing with yeah with bodybuilding with like <laughs> Arnie and yeah so after did, he did some training courses with uh, with uh, Arnie and Lou Ferrigno and people and oh, all those oh blimey so he, gosh yeah and he was, yeah. He was basically start training the all the big bodybuilders at, at the time so he was quite a quite a good guy to actually be mentoring you if you like so yeah so yeah that's how I started off the say the professional side of the, mm-hmm. the coaching so it was quite interesting. Gosh, so um, at, at what point did you realise that you, because you'd already had a bit of, I suppose, entrepreneurial opportunity through setting setting up your um, your moulding business. Yeah. S- did did you carry on with, with that sort of business structure, or how how did it all come um, together? At the, at the time, because the the I, I I was doing enjoyed doing the actual. Um, maintenance gym maintenance against stuff because i found it quite easy compared to what we're doing yeah and the hours i was putting in doing the doing the um the molding and that kind of actual time i wasn't getting the reward back it was quite hard yeah and the even though we, we were busy but you know it was, it was just no time to do anything for yourself so yeah. and i was getting better reward from doing the, the gym maintenance okay things. and you know i was out meeting people and there's quite a few gyms on the island which you know i was doing the, doing the maintenance for so I thought, okay, I enjoy this. I think, right, just break away from what I've done for the last 15 odd years. Yeah. And I just thought I took a gamble on doing, so I was doing gym maintenance for, um, and installing gyms in people's houses Yeah, as well. sure, yeah. You still, yeah. Do, you still do that quite a bit? Uh, not so much now, but I mean, I'd say probably before I started uh, Elite, yes. I was doing I was in quite a lot of that. I've done quite yeah. a few okay. gyms around the island. Yeah. Uh, great. So, at what point did you meet Steph, your business partner, and uh, start up a lease? Yep. Yeah, um, so, we've had a lease for seven years. So, before that, I tried to buy uh, the Nautilus Gym, right, um, from George Mitchell, and um, so, and George mentioned that Stefan had approached him about buying the gym as well, right. And we knew the actual. Just got chatting in the gym one day about, you know, what what how much George wanted and that kind of thing, and it was a bit unrealistic in the actual the, the, the price he was asking yeah so then we um so i just spoke to him one day and i said well what about you know if we could do it what what are your plans and so his 
his plans, he, like, he, he'd written down were pretty similar to mine. Yeah. So we looked at everything from, you know, from the size of, 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 the, of the premises to the number of people you want to make it viable. So, yeah. So, yeah, it really sort of like... We, uh, so did the two of you between you? I mean, it's quite unusual to go and talk to your who turns up to be one of your competitors about going to set up your business, and it's 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 yeah. refreshing actually. And that was good. Was, I think because we we actually had a, our end goal, if you like, was pretty similar in how we but you know how we could could achieve it. I mean, his background is in IT and in business side of things. Yes, and mine has obviously been in a more hands on mechanical side of things. So and it gelled really well. And I think when we we looked at it, you know, what he could bring to the table, what I could bring to the table, really. Yeah. It complemented each other quite well. So, and, that, and then when we sat down, I thought, okay, can we do it? And then it's, you know, like I said, everything, things that he brought and things I brought, just, you know, just thought, yeah, this is realistic. We actually can work together and work together and, yeah, uh, and do this. Yeah, no, it's great. No, and here we are today and you have Elite Gym and it's been going for seven years and you've survived COVID. Yes, we have. <laughs> Which is uh, no mean feat in itself. I mean, that's, that's, that's great. How has it been? You know, how did you... Um, how did you cope during the lockdown and would you find yourself, you know, uh, able to cope again if, if we had another similar sort of uh, yes, period I mean, like that? We, we, we're in a pretty fortunate position that when we've got such a loyal um, membership, member, member based members, I should say, the people that really were supportive of us and the people that could... Um, continue to pay the, the gym subscriptions, which really helped us keep keep everything moving, if you like. So, yeah. you know, that was that was fantastic. You know, we didn't expect to be, you know, to have people saying, "Oh, I'm going to support you and continue paying." Because it was an unknown. We didn't know. Nobody knew how long it was going to be locked down for. So, you know, that was that was great. So, from that point of view, yep, yeah, we we did have the support of all our members, um, and we did. We're also from a financial point of view, we're looking at hopefully moving the gym forward, moving premises. So, we did have reasonable amount in reserve which was, was quite good as well yes i hope so yeah so is is that managing to um is that is that still a, a goal oh yeah um we've got a few things uh, you know irons in the fire irons in the fire if you like so no, yeah no, that's fine yeah. yeah so from a business point of view yeah we're constantly looking at how we can improve what we're yeah. doing yeah i mean with what you've got you do wonders really because it's yeah. you know it's, it's probably Oh, I suppose the least loved part of that um, estate, isn't it? And, and yeah, you guys do great things think, with yeah, well, everything else that's around you is empty. So yeah, I think we are limited to just what as we well can. for the car park. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so from yeah, from the building point of view, we're limited to what we can do in the building. So I think going back seven years ago, and you looked at it was a six thousand square feet building. You think, oh my god, how are we going to fill this? And but yeah, so what we did, we've continued to reinvest in machinery and that yes. kind of thing. So we've. You know, we every normally try and do every six months put something new in. Well, it explains why the maintenance of the machines is so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one thing I try and pride myself on that we've we've got a really good relationship with the suppliers of machines as well. So yeah. any part or anything we get, we normally can get them quite quickly. And oh, that's that's brilliant. So and then obviously from a uh, you know the fact that I use the gym myself quite regularly, I can uh, notice when things are either yeah not quite right. Yeah, or, and you've got some real gobby clients who tell you immediately, um, don't of they? Of course they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if you. Don't mind me asking, and I primarily ask this when I meet people in my role as yeah. a financial planner. Um, what was your earliest memory of, of money? Since you run your, your own business these days, and you've you've had a lot of goes at, at you know in, yeah. at running small businesses, what's your earliest memory that, of it? I think growing up, like I said, I grew up on a farm and things. So yeah, you know, there's if you needed something, you know, you, it wasn't given to you. You had to either you had to earn it, or work for it. Um, and I think one of my biggest memories was a. Uh, uh, I used to, again, coming back to athletics, I was, I was away training. I was uh, competing somewhere. Yes, for Ireland or for the Ireland. Uh, this is this is in Ireland. So I was, right. I was probably, I don't know, maybe twelve, thirteen, fourteen age group. Yeah, it's quite quite you know that age sort of thing. And um, do you remember where you went? Uh, it was in it was just a local competition in right. Ireland, I think. Yeah. Um, but one of uh, one of the guys was competing. He was quite flashy. He had all the all the gear. All like, the gear and some idea. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he had a thing like he, he did, I remember at the time he had a big stereo and it was like it was a really nice, so warm, sunny day. And he had like a group of people around him because obviously he had all the gear, the, the cool, stereo. Cool and he was a cool kid. Yeah. And I was going, oh, well, I would, that's why I want a stereo like that. And um, obviously at the time I didn't have any money. My family, you know, they said, well, if you need it, if you want it, work for it. So I was doing it to end for the summertime. I was working on my uncle's farm. And of course, then end of the summer, 
I got some cash. I was like, wow, I've got all this. Now I can go. Yeah. So that was, that was probably the first time, I think. Did you go and buy the stereo as a matter of uh, interest? Yes, I did. You did? Okay. Did. And uh, yeah, kept it for, for many, many years, actually. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite interesting. But yeah, so that was probably the first. And then second thing, there's a, a local shop. And again, when I was growing up, um, the owner of the shop, you know, used to go in and you wouldn't have enough money for to buy what you want. And uh, he was really good. He goes, well, you know, if you put it aside, come back tomorrow, come back next week, you'll have what you want. So <laughs> uh, things like that. So it's not stuck in your memory. So you think, OK, and I've always been in the background. Been, well, if you want something, you know, it's up to you to, to obtain it. So yeah. you know, if you work hard enough, you can get it. Yeah. Then do, you tra- do you translate that forward with your own kids? Do you um... uh, try to as, best, as much as possible? Yeah. So. I find it's quite interesting actually. I find that probably a little bit more my my second, my, my daughter. She's eight. So I'll probably push her and make her work a little bit harder than my son because I think I'll probably try to sport him when I first won, sport yeah. him a little bit. But now he's, he's at that age now where he is. He's got a, he's asking for not just, you know, 50p or 20p. He's asking for iPhone 10s, iPhone 12s. You've got it. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> you make him work a bit harder for, <laughs> for, that, for that. Yeah, that's no, good. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm of all, all the things that you've done throughout your life so far, what, what, thing what things have given you the most fulfillment so far would you say um obviously my kids that's one of the amazing things it's just amazing being being a dad yeah and just watching you know two little people you know just grow and, and become you know their own individuals and that's probably one of the things i'm most proud of yeah um, what about from a business point of view a uh, business point of view i think Obviously, yeah, elite. That's um, something which, when you when I was working in Nautilus Gym, was managing that, and this thing, frustration of seeing, you think, oh, I could be doing this, or we could do this, and making suggestions to the owner, and then not nothing being done with it. Yeah, I thought, well, okay, we've got, you know, so it's yeah. So once we we went from an empty building to them, the first time was probably the, the most proudest was we had all the machines in when we switch the sound system on and it's almost like you know, I remember at the time thinking right the gym's got a bit of a heartbeat now it's alive it's yeah. it's gone from being machines and a from an empty space to full of machines to right this is an actual gym so and yeah the reason, actually the reason I look back at some of the photographs from how the work we did from being an empty shell to to where it is now you know it's quite interesting looking at the progress and the time limit we had on that as well because we we had a bit of an issue with um, obtaining keys for the building, uh, so we had we were meant to get the keys in an April, April 2013. But because there was an issue with the car parking in the road, our advocate wouldn't let us sign the lease until okay. all that was sorted out. <laughs> car park wars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but in the meantime, we yes. had we'd already planned. We would booked to radio, so we booked a date for advertising. We got printing thing, uh, our, our information printed up on opening dates, and because yeah. we planned on obviously we had a, a plan on on what we we're going to do. We Regarding the you know, the sales and marketing side of things, all yeah. that was was set for a certain date, and because it was getting closer and closer to the point, we think okay, we're going to be running out of time to, yeah. to actually construct what we needed to do and get it all. So, on the twenty sixth of July, it was twenty thirteen. That's when we. We right. opened the doors and yeah. Steph and myself were there laying the floor in the studio we had at the time. Yes. We finished at four o'clock in the morning and we were opening at eight o'clock the next day. So It's amazing what you can do on adrenaline, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is that the gym has changed quite a lot though, hasn't it? Have you, is it, has it been sort of a case of evolution or seeing what works, what didn't work? Um, yeah, so we, I mentioned before the studio, we had a, a studio which was it was about 500 square feet. Yeah, it was wasn't classes there, wasn't there? Yeah, so we did, we did run classes, cause which we thought, yeah, that's what people want. But what I found is, because it's the sort of, I think because of the machines we choose, and it's it's a very active hands-on gym, if you like. Mm-hmm. So people do, the number of active users is quite high. The studio wasn't getting used as efficiently as, as we thought. You know, the busy classes were very busy, then during the day yeah. it wasn't so good. So we sat down and we thought, okay, what's... What do we need or what people need? So we, we looked at people who needed more machines, so we needed more cardio machines, more resistance machines, more weights. So we thought, okay, let's... And sac- space for free weights too yeah. as well. So we basically we sacrificed the studio yeah. and we created a little bit a bigger space for doing circuits and that kind of training and just made it the gym a bit bigger. So we introduced more machines. So we thought, we thought people wanted it, which seems to have worked quite well. Yeah, good. And you, you see you, you've also got a hairdresser up there too, haven't you? She's yes. in the corner. <laughs> She's in there the, as well. Yeah. So yeah, one of our members, she was uh, looking for some space at the time. And when we were doing the studio, 
we thought, okay, we could create a few different rooms. So one of the things we created was a, a room for the personal trainers because we've got quite a few there now. Yes, yes. So we needed somewhere for them to obviously have lunch yeah. and somewhere yeah. to sit down. It was and very chill disconcerting out. in the main gym. Someone would stick chicken ding in and then it, <laughs> the yeah. whole gym would smell of it, but it doesn't now. Yes, yeah, so that's something which we, yeah, obviously, yeah you know, evolution. We thought, okay, we've got more people working there. So we created a yeah. space for those. And at the same time, yeah, we had a little few extra rooms. We thought, okay, what can we do with these, the extra yeah. space? So what did you do? So, yeah, we bought Keelan, who's uh, the house of hair. So yep. she's in there, which has been a great success for her. Yeah. Um, we've also introduced the uh, sunbed, which has been you know, quite good as well. Yeah, which obviously I don't use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me either. Okay. <laughs> Very good. And I can ask you this because you've had so much experience of it. So any existing or aspiring business owner or entrepreneur, what would be your number one business tip, Kevin? Uh, never give up on your, your goals. Uh, it may take you a year, 10 years, 15 years, always, whatever. If you've got a dream or a target, just work towards it. Because never give up. Because, you know, that's, that's something which I've learned. It took me a long time to get to where, where we are now. But looking back on it, it's, um, you know, the actual development, the experience I've gained getting to where I am now is, you know, you just, you know, if I, I could have given up many times, I think, oh, you know, it's not attainable, but... You know, it's one of those things that if you work for it, you know, you can get it. Yeah. Okay. That's really good. Is that, is that the advice you'd give your younger self? Definitely. Yeah. I yeah. think probably with just the background as well from athletics, I think, okay, you train, you set, you set yourself a goal, a target. So whether it be, in our case, it used to be Island Games or Commonwealth Games, like whatever whatever your targets are, yes. you, know, you need a plan to get there. So, yeah. so starting out know, point A to point B, just, just continue and just, just develop as you go along. Mm. You know, constantly change, but just still it's that end goal. You know, always focus on the end goal, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, great. So, what do you do to relax uh, when you're not working? Keep when I'm not working, yeah. Well, between you know my children and uh, home life, whatever it. Um, my passion is again come back to mechanics, cars. So one of the things I tend to relax in, I'm, I'm restoring an old car that I used to own many years ago. Yeah, you said it's a Toyota Celica, isn't it? Yeah, Toyota Celica. It's a GT4 which I owned when I was. So we were twenties, I think. So it would have been mid twenties. So it's about twenty. I think about twenty-four years ago. <laughs> one of those ago. cars where the, where the insurance premium was worth is more than the car, the yeah. value of the car. That, <laughs> one, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I was. Uh, yeah, it's quite fortunate to. Um, you know, I've always had a passion in cars so, and that kind of thing, so mechanics and that. Um, and I just by chance we found. Well, I was in a field and I, I ended up speaking to the guy who had it. So I thought, oh, okay. And, you know, it'd, be, it'd be good to, re- to have that back and restore it. So you're doing so that? I'm doing that in my well, spare time whenever, whenever I get a chance. Right, excellent. So tell me what you think are the best things about living in the Isle of Man. Since you've come from a bigger island to this yeah. island, what, what, what are the best things about living here? I think obviously the quality of life. I mean, you've, you know, it, it's, it's um, you've from a you know, safety point of view. I mean, it's great for, for kids growing up. And there's so much, you know, for to do whether it be sport or, you know, you've got motor sport, you've got, you know, all sorts of, you know, whether it's in my background case of athletics, but you've got football, you've got cycling, you've got running. It's just there's so much to do from that point of view. Mm. Um, and the, the other man, considering it's a small place, the, the standard of, you know, the, it's producing world champions from, you know, cyclists and, yeah. you know, runners, walkers. It's, it's just an amazing place. And obviously, yeah, got the TT as well, which, and tracks normally. Yeah, normally. <laughs> normally who knows? Track, yeah. Yes. So, and, yeah, and remember, I found this out. It's always dry in the gym. Exactly. So no matter the weather, <laughs> we've always got you know some good good cardio equipment in the gym. So yeah, it's good. What but would you say are the main challenges that the Isle of Man faces? I think how you look at the from businesses. I mean, it's attracting attracting businesses here. I think that's one thing just to keep the the, the economy growing. Because obviously, it's got a massive big e gaming and, um, and so you know, just to develop that. But things like the you know, tourist industry. That's uh, Obviously, we've got local staycations now, but, you know, just, just on that, you know, making the, I know, the Isle of Man, it's a, on a global, you know, just advertising on a global scale, really. Because mm. a lot of people, I mean, even people I've, I've met over, over the years through the athletics and stuff, because we've been fortunate to travel around the world, a lot of people know because of TT. So yeah. you mentioned the Isle of Man, they go, oh, TT races. So, I mean, that's in itself. So that yeah, people know about the island. So, but yeah, from a business point of view, just there's, you know, it's, it's something which I think that could be developed. Yeah. No, good. Maybe we could have a little chat about the the planning and the ability to be able to get somewhere which is a large enough square footage um, for a gym. I mean, you, you can talk about that if you want, Kevin. Yeah, and no, I think from the from obviously our point point going forward, 
and there's the cost of um, retail units on the Isle of Man are quite, you know, is, is expensive. Um, and obviously, you yeah, the cost of any land and houses and that, you know, it's, it's a, it is an expensive thing to be into. So renting somewhere, it's difficult to find something that would suit you. Exactly yeah, need for you, you need a massive warehouse, yeah. close enough to a centre of population, but with a massive car park, don't you? Yeah, so our issue really is the, there's lots of units we could have over the years could have think, oh yeah, they'd be, they'd be suitable, but yeah. the problem is planning regards parking and we need we need a, a large number of car parking spaces which is the that's probably the restricting side of it as well yeah i see um what's the uh, the development over by eden park the where yes electrical is mm. i always thought that would make a fantastic gym for you with um, yes. that sort of whole block with glass fronted and uh, yep. two floors <coughs> and yeah that would be yeah so we, we looked at that actually when yeah. it was being developed um right. And one of the restrictions, again, was the number of space, car parking spaces. And for us to, to make it really viable, and because it would have lent itself, as you said, yeah. two floors, grass um you couldn't put uh, an extra second floor in because the actual number of allocated parking spaces per ah, unit. This so, seems a little <laughs> short-sighted. <laughs> um, so again, yeah, I think what's happening now is a lot of the companies who are manufacturing are building these units. Yeah. Um, they're looking at obviously getting as many people in the units as possible, but, you know, they... The restriction, the restrictions on parking, it seems to be the, the main issue. Yeah, do you think with with closer um, closer proximity to other premises that would drive the same sort of footfall? So you know, you've got your garden centre next door. Okay, people who go to garden centres don't necessarily go to gyms. Yeah, but they're all like eating food. You know, you'd, you'd have a decent cafe. You know. Yeah. So. Uh, we are looking at obviously constantly looking at premises and what's available and what's yeah. actually coming up. So, mm. and we have spoken to the, the company, but the land, landlord where we are now, they're looking at redeveloping the site we're in. Yeah, so okay. We have, we have spoken to them about, you know, would they build as a purpose-built premises? And and again, the the, the restriction is the parking side of it because obviously they, you're taking up a lot of land with, you know, 30, 40 cars and <laughs> taking up a lot of space. So they yeah. could put, potentially put another unit there with. I think an average of 10 parking spaces. So. They could, but they could do a nice uh, double-floored uh, car yeah. park, couldn't they, on, on a plot at the same time and exactly. solve, drive more. It's, it seems a yeah, little so short-sighted. It's something which we're, we, are, we are looking at and we're speaking yeah. to a lot of the fantastic the, the major uh, manufacturers or the major oh, builders. fingers crossed. What solutions and opportunities could you see in the Isle of Man? Say, if you were a government minister, what would you do? Apart from changing planning laws. <laughs> changing, yeah, changing, <laughs> changing planning laws. Um, yeah, I think, obviously, you look at where, where the businesses are focused. I mean, you look at, you've got big, massive, big retail parks in the UK, which are obviously, from, you know, phenomenally successful. So, um, and I think in something like that, which I would, from, again, from a business owner, the things that are restricting us moving forward is mm. the actual, say, parking side of things. And I know at the moment, most of it is on a greenfield site, so developing that. So I think that's probably what's slowing things down from, from yeah. that development point of view, which is understandable, because, but there are areas which you think, okay, well, that can be zoned as a, because you've got retail units around it, for example, like you mentioned, Eden Park, for example. Mm. But yeah, there's a lot of places like that which you think, okay, you could develop it and, you know, I know it's taking businesses away from the town centre, but, you know, it's... Uh, yeah. Well, there's nowhere to park in there and the roads are all yeah. <laughs> a bit bumpy. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> what have you got planned next? What, what's, what's, um, what's on the cards with you? From a business point of view? Um, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why not? A uh, business point of view is to yeah, expand the gym. Where the, the main thing we're focusing on really is, is the new premises. Yeah. Um, we've got just under six years left on where we are. Right, so it's a decent uh, medium-term plan then. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's the, the main focus really is, is looking at expanding into a bigger premises because I think that's restricting us from moving forward. So there's, there's areas that we want to yeah, re- sure. develop, which, yeah. and especially with looking back on, you know, look at COVID and how that's affected our business. Think about well, what areas of, you know, could we do things we could have added in, which we were planning on doing in the future. But again, it's just the yeah, space and the, you know, <coughs> that is the limiting factor. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Okay. And what about from a personal point of view, getting the, getting the Salika on the road? <laughs> yeah. Again, long-term goal. So that's something yeah. which I'm, you know, doing slowly but, but surely. Yeah. Doing any um, bodybuilding contests? Uh, no. I think from that point of view, just trying to stay as healthy as possible is my, <laughs> <laughs> that's my long-term goal as well. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Uh, there's there's a couple of questions I always ask um, guests. Just so that listeners are, uh, are interested in knowing of it. Are there any books you've read recently that you'd recommend? Any any sort of book. Uh, the late last one I think I read was the I think it's which, uh, anybody who's in business probably read it is the um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Oh yeah. Um, yes, I've read that. So I've, I've reread it. I should say I read it a long time ago. I've just been rereading that as well. So yeah, that's probably the, the last one of them yeah. I've picked up recently. Yeah. What sort of points did it 
what was the main point that it gave you from that? The main thing really is just the interesting from your upbringing, how that can influence your what you think and, and will limit what you can think in some ways. So I think really it's uh, like just gain as much experience as possible. Yeah. You know, listen to all sides of the story if you like, and yeah, so that's that's it. Just don't don't limit what you you know how you uh, constraints you should say as you're growing up. Just you know look forward and wider wider that's it yeah, wider yeah. the bigger picture yeah good that's, that sounds really good I might give it that a go rich dad poor dad yeah. okay and what's your favourite quote do you have one I think yeah the usual what doesn't kill you makes you stronger yeah. I think from a, <laughs> from a gym point of view you train and train and train and you think yes. okay yeah. so yeah and again just purely from a uh, physical point of view you look at how your body responds to what you do so you know but it's not only just physical but mental thing as well so that's something which it's great having the gym there because you can just go in and lose yourself for an hour or whatever and just you know focus on you and you so that, that's a good thing yeah and of course again how your body responds from the you know the hormone effects and the, your endorphin kick you get from it just it also, it's a positive thing yeah i remember a gym membership is not just for christmas no yeah <laughs> where can people go to learn more about you and the the work that you're doing you've, you've got a facebook page i know for elite gym but um is there anything else that, that we could let listeners know about oh so yeah facebook we've got instagram as well right okay so that's something which um yeah going forward we've we, we're We've also got a link to all the personal trainers on the on our Facebook, and so that's something which you know you can learn more about us and the business and who we are and who actually works within the within the four walls of the of the building. And what would you say to somebody who's thinking about joining a gym and has never done it before? Because there's quite a drive, I think. There's, there's the Corona Stone, isn't it? People have put weight on yeah. uh, during during I know I have, but uh, so is is there anything? Um, what, what would you? Yeah, I think. Obviously, from my experience, I've been in, in that environment for, for, well, most of my life. Um, so, yeah, I'm not scared to walk through the doors of, of the gym. But that's obviously, yeah, from what I know, the biggest thing is people saying is to walk through the doors. Yeah. Just, so maybe just like what we're looking at folks are doing in the future is, you know, bring a buddy. So if you've got somebody who's a gym person, think, oh, you know, somebody you, you know, sort of thinking about talking about it, you know, just come along. We also do like a free day. You can come and try the gym out and no actual cost. So that's a good thing as well because people yeah. think they're not afraid to come and try it. So, yeah, if you come along with your friends, I would say the biggest thing would be just, you know, if you're thinking about it, get somebody, you know, go with somebody who knows or who has been to the gym. That's just really it's good. that initial just walk through because the whole thing, that, you know, you, your mind and what you think the gym's like and the environment's like, it's, you know, once you're in there, suddenly that changes because obviously you're brave enough to walk through the doors, then it's the, it's the biggest step, I think. Yeah, yeah it is. And it's be quite daunting at, at peak time, I guess, with all the, yeah. all the big, you know, guns out yeah, that's brigade. Quite, yeah, that's a, it's quite interesting, actually, people's perception of what the gym is like. And when you're actually there and you're actually in the environment, you know, people are people go. Oh, I don't want anybody looking at me and thinking I'm, you know, judging me or whatever. But most people in there tend to be either looking at themselves, uh, <laughs> are focusing on themselves, or are in the same, pretty much the same boat. At some point, would have been in the same boat as you were walking in. So, you know, it's it definitely say to people just don't be afraid to walk through. Yeah. If you are, just you know, bring a friend or ask a friend to come along. That's always a good way. So, but once you're in there, hopefully, what we've we've always tried to do is make it be as friendly as possible. You know, when you come in, be as welcoming and and obviously listen to what people want and what their fears are and what they're obviously again what the targets are. Yeah. So we've got you know really I would say a good bunch of of um, people who work within the gym. So you know I try and what I, I, I try and do as well with some people is just like, you know looking at who comes in what they want to do and try and think ah oh, that person for example our PTs we could have you know Kane or June or whatever we, we put Steve we could put, put the trainer next to the, the oh, person that. that's so interesting that's some, yeah something which I try to do which seems to work reasonably well yeah that does yeah I have to say from from a, a punter's point of view it, it is um, it is a friendly gym you always get a smile when you come in and oh, that's good yeah good feedback I never regret having been to the gym is there anything else that um, I haven't asked you that I should ask you Kevin like anything else you want to say that um, um, I think for you on the main point I think there you know, like I say just the, from, from our business point of view just bringing people getting people into the gym and keep people keep people in the gym when they're there so I think that's a, yeah. you know, that's obviously down to how friendly we are and, and obviously whatever feedback we get we're trying to improve constantly improving what we're doing yeah, that's great. Well, well, listen, Kevin, thanks so much for your time Thank today. You. And I've learned a lot. And, uh, you know, coming along and being a guest on Island Influences, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influences. 
from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.